This episode of the Blind Man Dan podcast is proudly brought to you by Country Duds. A bad word doing good things. I swear it's country. All right, boys, girls, to choose. Blind Man Dan's poor sight. Poor bastards running into objects in the broad daylight. Fuck. Blind Man Dan's now live. This is a hazard. So nut sacks and front cracks, listen up, enjoy the ride. All right, boys, girls, to choose. I'm here at... HHA talking to John Kelly. How are you, mate? Good, how are you going? Good, buddy. Appreciate you giving me the time to do this interview, man. Pleasure. Good to see you. I'm buddy, um, a couple of weeks. I'm trying to pump out the interviews while I'm here. I thought, fuck, I've been watching you for ages. So, like, all started with me, you've been following you right back at Mega Truckers. Yep. Obviously. Yep. And I thought you were a fucking inspiration. So, for me, like, I, um, like I was in Earth Movement at the time. Like, when yep. I was 21, I started my company, Earth Movement Company. And, and um, yeah, started building it up, whatnot. But I was diagnosed with this eye condition at 16, and it was only bad night vision. But the second thing I did to close is my peripheral vision. So over time, I think I got my license, and then I drive at night. Yeah. Um, but then I fucking buy the trucks and diggers and whatnot to get the earth moving. And every year I had to keep going and get my medical to tip the license. Yeah. And yeah, 2023 they took it off me. Is that right? Yeah, they said no, you're done. <laughs> fucking hell. So. And I said, um, I said, just take my truck license, let me keep my car license. Yeah. The doctor goes, you have a fucking truck license. <laughs> I was like, oh, you never had a fucking truck license. Like, oh, right. Yeah. So yeah, I was like, I was right into the, into the trucks and earth moving. And so like, your show obviously yeah. was a lot of bloody, yeah, a lot good to, good to watch for me. And I found inspiration in you with what you were doing. You know, young age building a business and you build a fucking empire. Right? And it was that, yeah, just loved it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, we had a bit of a crack. A bit of a crack, yeah. yeah. Went all out. But he, um, we'll start, we'll sort of begin. Like, what was your upbringing like? You got mum, dad, wealth, did you get the money or you started? No, so I suppose, you know, um, winding the clock back, my grandfather was in trucks and ran Darwin, and my dad, then my grandfather's on my mum's side, and then, uh, my dad had a truck sales business. And, you know, I suppose going through school. Dad put me through a really good school here in Brisbane, went to boarding school here, and you know, I was the poorest kid at the richest school. Yeah. You know, and that's yeah. that's always a good foot up the ass to get you motivated, you know? Yeah, for sure. um, and yeah, I just got a, a very good work ethic from my old man and my grandfather, who just both of them never had an off switch. They always just worked really hard, and I suppose that's one thing I'm grateful um, that I sort of grasped was was having a really good work ethic and yep. um, always just worked hard. So what um what was your first job? Um, first real job was well apart from you know I worked for my grandfather in the truck yard and all that sort of stuff and well, that was from the young age of shit like 10, 12 years old yep. and when I was at boarding school and like high school he picked me up Friday afternoon and dropped me back Sunday and I fucking just worked. <laughs> like a madman yeah. all weekend for 50 bucks cash yeah, yeah you know which you know i look back and think you fucking tied up bastard <laughs> but you know when i was the coolest kid in the school on wednesdays we used to go down to twong village and i could fucking buy a truck and life magazine and a yeah. mambo t-shirt and i was the coolest kid around fucking loaded you know <laughs> um, yeah. so, you know from there my first real job outside the family uh believe it or not was i started work for brown and hurley here at Darra, um, in the used truck division. So a good mate of the old man's, uh, Chris Curzio and Brad Carlford worked there. And yep. um, they were like three stooges, those, those my old man and Chris and, and Brad. And um, basically got a job there and in the used truck yard and was there sort of appraising the used trucks. The so used trucks would come in, I look at the condition, you know, appraise them and that sort of stuff. And then, um, you know, run around the paint shops and do the refurb process. And, and Chris was always very good, I suppose, with his trucks, doing them up, always painting them up fancy. And Dad was the same. So it was it was, awesome. it was an awesome job. Um, Are you hands-on yourself? Are you mechanic? You got a trade behind you? Or I've got a trade. No, so you've just been, been around your whole life, so you yeah. all do all the shit. Yeah. Uh, the first 10 years of my life, we'd, we'd fuck something and be stuck on the side of the road. You've got two choices, either yeah, fix it or you stay there. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, definitely. So, so what age? So you end up buying your own truck, starting your own truck? Yep, 19. 19. I bought my first truck. Yeah. It was a Bicentennial Superliner. Yeah, nice. Well, actually, wind that back, I, I bought another Superliner, um, and... Well, I was, so I left Brandon Hilly up here 
and then went and worked for the old man down in Melbourne for a little while yeah. at Austrance. Yeah. And then um, didn't really like working for my old man officially. And it's fucking hard to work for your old man. Yeah, yeah. And I just wanted my own identity. Yeah. And then Kenworth advertised for a position in Melbourne for a used truck appraiser um, in the used truck division. And, you know, I applied for the job. There were 300 applicants, and I was 17, nearly 18, and, and got the job out of, like, nearly 300 applicants. Um, oh, fuck. Yeah. Was that's, a, that's the money. Like a job I can't say you learn about. Yeah. yeah. Come and appraise trucks for us. Yeah. Yeah, look, look, it was a big deal back then. Like, used trucks is a bit of a thing of the past now yeah. um, in terms of, like, dealerships running their own used divisions. Yeah. Uh, and that's why we've done so well over the last four or five years. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, turning back the clock back to then, um, I got that job, told Dad I was resigning and going to work for, effectively, the enemy. Yeah. And he <laughs> fucking went off, you know. And for that be there. Yeah. Yeah, we, we had a mass. We didn't talk for probably two years. Oh, shit. Sure. Yeah, he took it to heart. Because then he goes, oh, you know, I brought you down here, gave you a job, all that sort of stuff. So, like, Dad, I just want to be my own person. And, you know, he was paying, I think it might have been 21000 per year. Yeah. Plus a car allowance, plus some commission. And his commission might have been, I don't know, 3 or 5% of gross. You know, so if you make 10 grand of a truck, you get 500 bucks. Whereas Kenworth were paying $80,000 a year, like retainer, plus... <sighs> Plus twenty percent of gross. That's but, a massive point, back. <laughs> but they never made money. They were a fucking useless division down there. So I came from Dad's business and the Brandon Hurley used business of Chris Curzio, where they used to make big dollars. You know, so I, I had the, you know, I had the smarts of knowing how to make money, and, and that that came from buying a truck, doing it up, present it, sell it. Can you turn that division around for him? Yeah. And you know, Tom How long did you run that position for? I didn't run it. I, I was there as a junior. Yeah. And there was a bloke there um, that was my boss by the name of Steve Muldoon. And we came in and I basically was in the process of, you know, wanting to paint trucks and do this and do that, pimp them, you know. And he was against it. And, and then I started doing it. And we started making bulk dollars. And I was, the first year I was there, I made like $140,000. As an 18 year old kid. Jesus, isn't it? You know, went out and bought myself a fucking brand new Malou Ute. Yeah. And I was, I was, I was, I was king of it. Yeah. You know? And yeah. Um, I suppose after being there for 12 months and doing really well, uh, there was a dealer principal there by the name of Dave Waldron. I'll never forget this. He, he was a great guy. And he basically uh, called me in for a meeting, sat me down with Stephen, said, Listen, John, we've got to do a problem. And one bright, what's going on here? And um, he goes, we put you on as a used truck appraiser and a sales cadet and you're actually selling more trucks than Steve and taking commission off him. So what we're going to do is we're going to give 50% of your commission to Steve going forward. And I just sat there and, oh, shit. and said, yeah, OK, no problems. And I thought, well, what, why reward someone who's working really hard with taking 50% of their merits? Oh, jeez. Like, as far as I'm concerned, yeah. you should get off your ass and have the fucking crap. Yeah. So... On that basis, um, I just put that in the memory bank, went around, there was a Max Super on it that came into stock, and I really liked the truck, and I just appraised it and said, you know, it was half a shit. When it wasn't, let it sit there for a couple of months, we had a write back policy. There, if the truck had been in stock for longer than 90 days, we could write it back. So, right. the mate of mine I was living with at the time, old Dan, um, who had a fucking no hoping job. Went and bought a jet ski and you got a personal loan for a jet ski for like 15 grand. What the fuck are the banks doing? Giving this bloke money. Yeah. Huh? So I went right, I went and got a business case together and said, this is the work I want to do. This is the revenue I'm expecting to make. Went to the bank and said, listen, I want to borrow $50,000 for this truck. And um, I said, no, sorry, we want to keep money to a new venture. Yeah. So I actually went back and thought about it for fucking about three or four hours, and I went, fuck this. I went in and applied for a loan for a jet ski. For 25 grand, they gave me a loan for a That's jet right, ski. straight up. So I went to NAB, and then I walked two doors down, went to Commonwealth, got a loan for a jet ski for 25 grand. Yeah, yeah. And said, can you please um, make the bank checks out to Packard, Melbourne, which was Kenworth, Melbourne. And um, I basically walked in with two bank checks and said, um, here's your check for your truck at the back, and belted up your arse, and... That's it. Came back to Brisbane and started started trucking and always wanted to work for my grandfather, so I rang him up and said, listen, I bought a truck. 
any chance of um, doing some work with you? And he goes, yeah, no problems. Come up with some trailers here. And he was in up in Darwin, was it? He was Brisbane and Darwin. Oh, yeah. He ran. He did all Hastings steering work. So you sat on road trains together or something? No, well, I, I was planning on doing heavy haulage with him. Yeah. And then my auntie intervened by the time I got back up here and said, told me to fuck off. And she didn't want me to be part of the business. I wanted to sell the business and I wanted him to sell the trucks. And oh, right. So I was sort of marooned in the middle of nowhere. So I uh, went and um, basically got as much money as I, together as I could and put a hundred grand deposit down on the trailer and then couldn't find anyone to finance me. So I found a loan shark in Lee by the name of uh, Jeff Turner. And uh, Jeff let me money at 26% interest rate. And that's how I started with the truck and a 50 tonne float. Oh, okay. Well, there's actually one of the questions I got to ask you was, what's finance? You know, yeah. how do you go about getting it? Yeah. And because uh, I've got no base was on you too. But I started out with an old UD cab over and I signed my ski boat to buy the fucking Tony Husky ball yeah. cab. And that's how I started. Yeah. But I went to Commonwealth and hey, they didn't want to give me, give me money. I want to buy like a hundred thousand yeah. truck. Right? Yeah. And they went, nah. And they ended up giving me a twenty-five dollar business loan. Yeah. And that got me sort of started. Yeah. But um, then moving forward, like, why would I just expand? Fucking banks couldn't give me money, eh? Hey. But what? And I ended up getting the, the loan shark as well. Yeah. And uh, fuck that stressful. <laughs> and you know, I, I worked really hard through that period and uh, had a fair few knocks in there learning business. And uh, I just went back to, down to Melbourne and did a lot of work around Melbourne and Victoria. Because I had contacts down there through um, the old man, and I suppose people I knew down there for the couple of years that I lived down there and got some really good float experience doing local around Melbourne. Because yeah. if you can move floats around Melbourne, you can move floats around anywhere. Yeah. You know, load under tram tracks and city suburban streets. And I'm in, like an eye pressure there. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the biggest fucking superliner in Australia. Yeah. Putting through little like places like Richmond and, yeah. you know, just, yeah. Pressure on. It, it, was, it was a great yeah. And then, um, just built built from there, bought another truck and bought another one and bought another one. So moving, like moving forward with you know, getting finance up that, were you able to go to the banks then or you still yep. kept doing those shots? Or? Yep, no, for, for the first two or three years, um, you know, I, I stuck with Jeff and then Jeff and I became really good friends, believe it or not, mm. and uh, he was my accountant um, up until a year and a half ago. So we, we've had a relationship of over 20 years and... Uh, he was alongside me as well um, from a business advisory role uh, through the sale to McAleese and then also through fighting the administrators and, yeah. and all that sort of stuff after HHA sold and, and they tried to fuck me. So Jeff, Jeff's been a very big part of my life. It's funny how you meet these people in life and again they come and press for life. Like, so yeah. my, my finance broken back then. Yeah. He, uh, he gave me 80%, but yeah. he was the only part that gave me money. So he did. I did 12 months with the old UD and I bought up the mechanic who could do his own road worthies. Yeah. So he gave back the machinery to pass on it. He goes, 12 months time, bring it back. And if it doesn't pass, I'll just run off with you. Know, it's off with you. Yeah. So yeah, the always did pass. Took out the pier to like, get the fuck out of here. Again, two, two hours ago at home. Yeah. And I took it back to him and said, oh, I wouldn't pass. He goes, oh, I'm not signing it off. Yeah. I'm like, you need a fuck load of words. And you told me you'd sign it off. So now all of a sudden, fuck, I need to get a truck. Yeah. So I had to go on a hundred grand with a truck. I still don't look at it. I ain't been in business 12 months. Yeah. And I met this fucking broker. And then I was just handing, you know, eight times a day, just what, weeks and weeks, never the best mates. <laughs> you yeah. know, that's how I got started, too. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's a fucking good time, buddy. Stressful time, a lot, that's for sure. Yeah. So you, um, oh, yeah, there, so you freaking, I got a piece of paper like this. So. So how long were you in business for until you got the second truck? I reckon I was in business for probably 18 months for two years. Yeah. Mm. And the second truck, who'd you put in that? I had a VAB line, which I bought off. It was an ex-RTA truck or an ex orphans truck. Rumble in the Jungle, I called it. Yep. And um, I had Bill Andrews go in that truck. He was sort of my first driver. And then um, I bought a third truck after that and sort of parked the Bicentennial and then just kept me and Bill. And then had a couple of other drivers sort of after that that sort of came and gone. Um, and then I got a bit fair dinkum about things and went and poached Dave Pansino, driver Dave. And that's when I sort of started doing Gangster's Paradise and bought Tommy Buckle Superliner and all that sort of stuff and yep. started kicking along with that. And yeah, Dave's, Dave's been with me 20 years next year. 
So it grew really quick. Didn't it? Yeah. Like it, it, that's well, about pretty quick, didn't it? Like when you had a HA today before you went over to Maple Leafs, how many trucks did you have that So uh, the day I signed over to Maple Leafs, I had 121 trucks. Fuck, that grew quick, man. Mm. Very yeah. Good. Yeah, I bought 50 trucks in one year. Yeah. Yeah. And I had plenty of work. We were, we were smashing it. This is where, like, I sort of went wrong a bit in the early, but, like, I got myself a pretty big debt, but I couldn't help it. There's work was there. Like, mm. I bought a truck, bought a risk of that. I kept on, kept on, kept on. There's a big debt to my guy. Yeah. And I fucking was just in all this debt, bought all this property, bought me old man out of property, why not? Yeah. And then I had all this shit that's couldn't fucking service and that. So it started yeah. going down to real bad. Then I lost my license. When I took the license off me, yeah. yeah, put a lot of fucking stress. So I had to pay some of the drive when I did go. Plus, I had to pay some of the drive around, get 10. What the fuck? Not for the hell, mate. But, um, fucking 100 trucks. So, when you, you got the um, like Mega Truckers, mm-hmm. how did that come? Was that your vision to do that show? Or no. you so, coached? A few years ago, a long time ago, I just had a YouTube channel that I just used to put our videos up, haven't done it in years, and our videos were getting heaps of views, just of us moving big shit, mm. and it was just videos I'd take on my phone or just upload them type of thing, and that side had like 20 million views, which was a lot back then. That's a lot of views, yeah. Yeah, and um, the producers at the time were the same producers that did Ice Road Truckers, so if you remember back in mm-hmm. the in sort of 2010 to 2012, that was a big deal that I was working on back then. So, so they came to Australia looking for a similar style of show where they'd get together with say five or six different transport companies and do like an Australian trucking series. Um, they came across my website and then they came across, I suppose, my YouTube channel and come and uh, approach me and say, can we catch up? So no problem. And they came out to the demo at Larry Pinto and just said, what the fuck is this place? Like, it was like Disneyland for truckers. Mm. And, you know, the caliber of work we do and, and how we do it, and I suppose the way we present our gear was second to none, and they said, well, fuck this, we'll just do the whole show on you. It's just basically it, yeah. So they shot a pilot um, episode, and the pilot episode aired, and there was um, they put it to nine separate networks, and seven networks came back and ordered the series. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck, man. And was there money enough for you? No, listen, you know, TV is a very interesting thing. Like, we, we don't get paid because it's a factual type thing, but, you know, it's $25 million worth of free advertising. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, yeah. Been, it's been phenomenal advertising. There's not many people out there that don't know the HHA exactly. brand and, and yeah. haven't, you know, that haven't heard the John Kelly name. Oh, exactly. Oh, yeah. Very, very well known. Uh, was it, you know, like, you got up to that. that 120 trucks before you signed over uh, the police. Was that, was it your dream to get that beat? Did you ever no. think you'd want to do that? It just happened. No, I, I thought that I would be king in the hill with five trucks. Yeah. And then I got to 20, then went way up. And then I got to 40. And then when we got to 40, we were right in the mix of all the LNG boom here in Queensland. And then the iron ore boom in WI. And we went through sort of the floods here in that 2010 so the 2012 period where Queensland got really quiet and then I just had it a gear and I looked at sort of some diversification of revenue streams about maybe going to the territory and going to WA. So if it's wet here or something goes on here, I can move trucks and, and vice versa. And there, there wasn't a lot of, I suppose, competition in the West for our big trailers. So we approached the West and went over there once we got awesome contracts. And that worked out great. And we were just very successful in the fields that we went after. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we were we were well, well advanced to any of our competitors. So as you're growing, was it more that there's work there? I know I can do that work. This, you wanted it? P- people were approaching that us. Was the, they, you needed to. Yeah. And the ironic thing is people say, how did John Kelly expand so quickly? And how, you know, he went broke and all this sort of stuff and he had no money. Well, that's fucking horse shit. Like, at the end of the day, you need to make money for a bank to lend you. Mm. So our turnover was really good. Our profit- profitability was really good. 90% of our revenue was all contracted revenue. So we had contracts for all of the major stuff we were doing. Um, and that made us very attractive to the people that were looking at buying us because um, it was easy to justify our income and justify our profitability. Once you turn to a company and they give you contracts that are there for 
the next three to five years and it's all written. And, and these are big companies we're working for, you know, Santos, Origin Energy, you know, um, a lot of oil and gas exposure, a lot of mining exposure, you know. Um, so we, we had some really good blue chip customers. Why did you do that thing with the with, uh, police squad? Um, it got too big for me. Were you, still, were you just doing this on your own? You yep. just one man show, you got managers and stuff like that? I had managers, yeah. you know, but I, I, I was the only owner, so um, the buck stopped with me effectively. And I always thought that I'd be a 20 to 30 truck operation, and I can run 20 to 30 trucks like nobody else can, and, and mint money. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it got beyond what I wanted it to be, and like I loved every minute. You know, and I look back at what I did and what I achieved and think, how the fuck did I do it? Was super the human, considering the timeline oh, and, yeah. and what we did. Um, but I was on a recipe for disaster in terms of me burning myself out. Yeah. And you know, at the same time, Joanne and I, uh, my ex-wife weren't getting on, and it was time for me to be a decent husband and a decent father. And um, on that basis, you know, from a risk point of view, I decided to sell, and from a family point of view, I decided to sell. And it wasn't a good move in the end. It wasn't a great move in the end. You know, I, I picked a, I picked a partner which I thought would be a strong alloy. You know, like um, not many people can say when they sell out to a publicly listed company that they expect a publicly listed company to go broke. You know, so uh, there was other offers on the table. And I was a bit stupid and naive with the with, with the deal that I took, um, and you know, on the basis of it being the arts. How long after you done that deal with them did it start going bad? I'd say nine or ten months. I, I could see. Yeah, you're watching it going bad too. Yeah. You're fucking been gut wrenched. Oh, it was terrible. Uh, yeah, it was terrible. You know, you've spent fifteen or sixteen years of your life building this business, and nothing else mattered. You know, like I, I blocked out my friendships, I blocked out my family life, um, I blocked out my personal endeavours to put the business first. Yeah. I and mean, put the people who worked for me first, you know. And to see someone come in and take that business and have no regard for your standards or what you do or how you do it um, was a very, very big setback for me on, on a personal level. Yeah. And, you know, I'll never ever put myself in that position again. And you'll keep it, you'll be the best. Yeah, well, yeah, I've, I've just changed my whole philosophy on life. You know? And I don't need to be a slave to it anymore. I've got a very good work life. All good? All good. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. On the way of um, debt was, how big a debt did I had about $110 million worth of gear on about $68 million worth of debt. $68 million in debt. What age were you going to have there? 32, 33. <laughs> so, like, oh, when I was 25, I was $1.6 million in debt. Yeah. And I was fucked with else, just beyond a joke, it's just for me when I fell asleep. slept. And I remember watching your show, thinking, fuck, I'm watch that this brings it, you know? Like, and then the, the funny thing is, is people talk about me and what I do and all that sort of stuff. Like, I had I had banks fighting over who was going to lend me money. You know, I had a line of credit with uh, Westpac Bank of $15 million. I had a line of credit with GE, $15 million. And I had a line of credit with CBA for about $18 million. Okay. All, all, like, I put, Open facilities. So I wanted to go spend forty-five million dollars. I had forty-five million bucks there. Where did you go? Ridiculous. It's insane. And this is like because you landed these contracts. Because we our revenue streams and our profitability yeah. was was there to support it. Yeah. So landing these contracts um, was because you wanted to talk about it. Or you were like, just to know how to go about it. How did you learn all this? Um, oh, just got very successful in our field. Um, I've always been a perfectionist about what I do. Um, and you know, you, I, I went after major projects. Mm. So major project means you know you've got a high volume in terms of revenue, and then your utilisation. So you're not just chasing a bulldozer to go from Brisbane to Mount Isa one week. It's 
you know, like we did the Gateway Bridge expansion, we had trucks there for, you know, nearly 18 months, three three platform low loaders doing three loads a day, you know. So that was like an $800,000 a month type job, you know. So those jobs there bolstered the other trucks and what they were doing. Um, and then, you know, people would see that we would run that project, so we'd get asked to tender on another project, and it was just this big groundswell of, of tendering work yeah. uh, and our conversion rate for, for winning work was phenomenal and, and our rates were we were the most expensive people out there but yeah. people would pay a premium based on the fact that they were getting mm-hmm. really good equipment really good people um, and getting the job done for that shit. do you find that's still the case because like when i was had the trucks and that i just could not believe the amount we're getting screwed as time went on it was just the screwing was more and more the, the industry now is exactly the opposite uh, it yes, seems to be the cheapest guy will win. Yep, 100%. doesn't care if they're fucking no. useless, they will win. You know, so I look back now and I had my heyday where I made a lot of money. A lot of money. Yeah. My record month is, I think we did around about 11.8 million in turnover and made 3.2 million clear profit one month. Until, uh, one month. Yeah. You know, so like to try and replicate that sort of revenue and that profitability. The infrastructure you need to do that's nice. bullshit. So when when this uh, went wrong with HHA, uh, when HHA went under, did you you were still set up personally yourself, or did you manage over that time? Or so um, when I sold the business, I sold fifty percent up front. So I got a check for that first. So you had that. Yeah, you know, I had the fir- check for the first fifty percent, and yeah. then I kept. I think it was fourteen or fifteen of my own personal trucks, and I owned them outright. Um, so I kept them and, you know, the deal was with McAleese that they were supposed to extinguish uh, mm-hmm. my guarantee on the equipment and Joanne's guarantee on our finance loans and they never did that. You saw your name on it? Behind their backs. So they never, it was part of the contract, all the banks, because we had such big exposure to the banks, our three majors, all of the share sale documents had to go to the banks and get approved because it was, it was a, a material change of, of um, ownership. So they had to sign off on the on the share sale agreement. Yeah. So they're all aware that Macleys have to sign us off the business, and you know the, the whole process taught me that the man who can tell the most lies and not get caught, and who knows all the lawyers in the high streets of Brisbane and Sydney and Melbourne wins. Yeah. Justice and right has got nothing to do with it. That Mark Rose saw from Macleys. He is nothing but a fucking snake in the grass. Yeah. He's he's fucked over that many people. You know, McAleese went down, then he reincarnated Rivet, and then ripped a whole heap of people off of Rivet. Now Rivet's gone, gone under again. Like I've just this where like when in business, I don't think I did that well. Like I started up a heap of businesses in the early days, I did my tourism and whatnot. But I just think I'm too kind hearted to be in business, and like people was. People I was you know, doing deals with, they were fucking brutal, they were savage, eh? And like, they pay off with your best mate, yeah. and they tr- you, and I went, I trusted them. Yeah. Trusted them that they wouldn't do wrong by me. Yeah. When it comes down to the end of the day, man, it's every man for themselves, eh? Yeah. Fucking savage. And, and that's what taught me, so when the shit hit the fan with HHA, no one protected me on my position. Right. And that, that was a heartbreaking part. It wasn't McAleese fucking me, it was, it was the fact that I had all of these guys and girls that I employed and almost put first. And um, when, when push comes to shove, no one really had my back. Yeah. And and that's what I suppose gave me a new appreciation of the Grand Zero. And and that's why this business and what I do, you know, moving forward is I do it with independence and I do it for my own sake. Like I don't put anyone else first apart from myself these yeah. days. Are you enjoying this business more? Hundred and fifty percent. You enjoy us more than the HHA, the, the, the haulage you're doing? Oh, listen, I, I, I love the haulage. I, I love the glitz and glamour of us moving big shit. You know, I've still got heavy haulage gear. No, it's a small truck out the front, right? Yeah, no, we've, we've still got plenty of big gear. Yeah. Um, but I treat the transport side like a hobby farm. Yes. So we do it when we want to do it, not because we have to. Yeah. So there's a big difference between running a business because you enjoy it, um, rather than running a business because you have to. That's it. Nothing in this business and nothing in this life now I'm moving forward for John Kelly is because I have to, yeah. because I want to. That's yeah. awesome. That's a fucking good position to be in. Yeah. It's a gift to give yourself, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I've got some more for you. What are we good? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 
So, <laughs> so on TV, and this is what I wanted to do this interview too, on TV you come across the river halves, you know, like you well, you could almost say Eric, like people, yeah, everyone's got their opinion of you, but they never met you. Mm-hmm. And I said, I'd love to meet this man. Yeah. And I said, I said to a man who showed up, I said, straight up, I don't think he's a hard ass because he's giving me the fucking time of his day for me to come in with him. So, are you a hard ass? He's a big buddy, teddy bear. Um, listen, in my personal life, I'm very much a fucking teddy bear. I'm very kind and nurturing and put all the time in the world for everyone. But in business, you know, I, I get my racing stripes on. And I'm all about staying in your fucking lane. Yeah. You know, everyone here has a job to do. They all um, have roles and responsibilities. And I shouldn't have to be the fucking headmaster at the school here, getting around with a cane, flogging fucking people because I don't know how to do their job. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we've had a bit of a clean out in our workshop a couple of months ago, or probably four or five weeks ago. So we had some mechanics and I sacked a whole lot of them, um, called them in about two weeks prior and said, right, guys, you need to pull your socks up. So my standards here, and you know it's always been about doing the job at 100%. And you know, I said you need to realise that every single phone line that comes in comes from this mobile phone here, which is my heavy haulage inquiry, my phone, truck sales inquiry, my phone, refurb inquiry, my phone. So when you miss something or fuck something up, so, they so read me. Yeah. I said so, and everyone here, this is like a fucking holiday camp. You know, work your own hours, do your own thing, just do the fucking job 110%. And they dropped the ball, and me and my boys, and a few, um, driver Dave and a few other guys went up to the Witten Outback Festival, and we sort of had four or five days up there, and um, I came back, and Shano gave them a list of things to do, and they fucked the dog, and got back on the Monday night, and seeing shit hadn't been done that I expected to be done, so I called them all in and said, boys, yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to keep having meetings chastising you because if, if you haven't got the standard by now, mm. you're never going to have the standard. So just pack your shit and fuck off. And it's the best thing we've ever done. Are you, do you find it easy to find more posts? Listen, we put an ad up and I got three guys in, you know, to replace the three that I had here. Yeah. Uh, and we did that within two weeks. And just the change in the whole camp and the change in the whole business here, it's chalk and cheese. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it was a hard decision to make, um, you know, because I had a lot of time for those guys here. But it was an easy decision when when people are dragging the chain. It's good that you find you can find files to replace it. Like up there on the Elm Beach, we are struggling. Like yeah. I, um, like I'm bringing people to trade. Yeah. The main one is a dealership out there. You can't find anyone. Yeah. Yeah, everyone I talk to, like mechanic guys, and they can't find fucking trade. And, and, and listen, don't get me wrong. Like the boys that have joined us here. <laughs> pretty freshly had a bit of apprehension about the John Kelly, what's John Kelly what to work for. Yeah. And like you give them a week out there or two weeks and they've been out there with Driver Dave and Gary and the Fab team and just, you know, working with Shane who runs the show here and, you know, I had Edward come up to me last week and Ed goes, fuck, this is just a really good place to work. You know, and I said, so well, I walked in the office here and you know, you see what you had here. Yeah. I just went, no, it's a fucking cool place. Yeah. You feel the vibe, it feels more. Yeah. Well, it's a nice place to be straight up. Yeah. Okay, no, that's all happen. Well, I'm also going to, yeah. So you, you got back on your feet pretty quick after this. Oh, no, how, what'd you do? Did you lay low for a while after HHA the 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 went down? So when the HHA the the shit hit the fan, um, they tried to be, well, Macaulay tried to be smart and they sacked me the day before they were going to put the business into administration. And what they were trying to do was sack me, push me to the side, put the business into administration, then come in and basically buy the equipment for one third of its value. Yeah. So I sat down with my main bank, which was Westpac, and they hated Macaulay. So a part of, um, I suppose, the panel of bankers for Macaulay, so they were on the nose. They were about to abandon their banking position. And I sat down with them and said, I've got a really bad feeling about this. Um, they said, well, we'll back you. I said, well, I've got money on the side there to bring up to your ears and bring the accounts back. And I want to take over the trucks. I said, no problem. So I just basically went in with the Westpac portfolio and took all that back. And then we put that um, auction that through Grays Online. So if people remember back in the HHA days, it was a series of auctions. There was Grays Online first, and then Pickles held a big auction on site. So the Grays Online sales made like record sales for a, for a pretty shitty time in trucking. Um, and there was no debt left with Westpac. There was actually a surplus. And then I owned all the depots. So I went through the process of selling the depots. So that, that was a big deal having to do all that. Um, and then I even went to my own auction and bought a whole heap of my own gear back. I see. <laughs> yeah. 
and, my pleasure. <laughs> and then um, did a deal with Toll because Toll were one of the interested parties there um, in terms of buying HHA, but I was too proud to sell to them because I didn't want them to paint the trucks. Yeah. You know? and, <laughs> yeah and, right. and in retrospect, I should have just shut the fuck up, taken the check, and paint the trucks. Painted the trucks. I put a little sticker on there instead. But, you know, so after that, I was with Toll for around about I had a 12 month contract with them, and that was an integration contract of integrating the newly formed heavy haulage business nationally. So I was a national business manager for Toll Heavy Haulage, yep. uh, which was interesting. So you're working directly for Toll? Yep. yep. Yep, I was a contractor there, and I still had my own trucks. So I still bought and sold trucks while I was there. And um, Toll was a very different dynamic to what I was used to. So they enforced the 38 hour week. So here I was, um, you know, 38 hours in John Kelly's life previously was between Friday afternoon to Monday morning. <laughs> yeah. you know? So, and I was living in Perth at the time because in the last few months of McAleese, um, we were button heads big time. And basically, Mark Rosson gave me an ultimatum and said to me that I can either be suspended without pay for 12 months or suspended with pay. It was option one and two. Option three is I'll come up with an option. So well, you guys are fucking retarded. So we haven't got a general manager of Perth, so I'm going to move over to Perth and run WANT and go to our avenues over there. And I moved over there and ran WANT. Yeah. And we won some fucking massive contracts over there during that period. Yeah. Um, so I, I lived in Perth for two and a half years. Um, yeah, it was a good toll and then sort of couldn't deal with living with Toll and uh, a really good mate of mine, Jason Miller and I, uh, who was also working for Toll, I said to Jason, fuck this. I put, we can't work for Toll anymore. This is this is just killing my brain cells. It was it was easier to watch Macaulay's fuck my business than work for Toll. Toll. So on that basis we left um, and we started a business called Aries Heavy Haulage. Um, and there's a funny story behind Ares. So Ares was the Greek god of war. Mm. So we were declaring fucking war on him. <laughs> and Ares heavy haulage was HHA backwards. It was A H H. Yeah, I've seen so, it later. Yeah. yeah, and then so Jason, you know, kept. We had a bit of a falling out because we we're very two very headstrong people. So I, I went the truck sales way and kept HHA, and Jason went the Ares heavy haulage way and painted his gear yellow and yep. was doing really well and. Um, yeah, that's so all good. Yep, yeah. yep. And um, yeah, that's that's when I sort of formally went down the, the truck sales route. And um, how did you keep the um, the HHA name once it once it goes into remission, doesn't it? Once it goes sorry, once it goes into bankruptcy, well, you better keep that name. Well, it was Heavy Haulage Australia. Yeah. And then oh, it's Heavy Haulage Assets. And then I did the Heavy Haulage Assets. Yeah, got me. And then retained. Yeah, the stock. All, all, all the logo and the icon. Yeah, yeah, right. I was wondering what was going on there. Yeah. I'll figure that out. Yeah. Yeah, uh, awesome, mate. And the, um, what would you, what would you do different? Like, like if you had. Can I grab real quick? Yeah, well. Do you reckon that arm structure didn't go in that? Which one? The one stock is going to spring back. Yeah, probably. Did if I take stock in now until I kick it up and sit down and pee him up and want to take me out to You don't care. bring it back to the yard, your old man doesn't want any fucking much. But no, but it. like stock, you can take it to his place. Just do it in the morning. Instead of driving, because he lives fucking close to the next door there, so. Does he? Yeah, he lives at Kingsville and it's that fucking, I guess like seven minutes from his house. Okay, well if you want to. I'll talk to stock here. If you want to run him up there. Yeah. Drop him off and then he can just take it home or fucking something, but don't fucking leave it in the No, place. it's not going to be out, obviously. Right, If you had your time again, would you have gone that big? Would you just say no to the work and stay a little smaller? Uh, listen, one thing is that I don't believe in regrets. You know, each, each road and every decision has led me to where I am today, and sure, I've made some mistakes, and I, I don't believe, my old man always used to say, you know, should never look back, only get a sore neck from looking back. So I take on what happened back then, and I suppose I've changed the way in which I do business moving forward. And that is, if you walk around this yard and have a look, we own everything. Yeah. You know, I've got, I've got less than a million dollars worth of lending on probably 25 or 30 million dollars worth of gear. That's awesome. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Stay out of that. Yeah, and next year I'll have zero lending. Yeah. You know, so, uh, 
I'm fucking awesome position to be here. A lot of hard work. Yeah. A lot of fucking humble pie. Yeah. A lot of humble pie. And I, you know, I don't go campus in the country on what we do and how much money we make and all that sort of stuff. I just show up, work hard. Yeah. Put those big risks. You know, like we've got probably 50, 60 trucks on the lot here. Um, you know, we turn and burn a lot of trucks, a lot of stock. Um, so the latest show, um, the restoration show, was that again? They, they approached you or was that you wanted to do? Save the juices as mega truckers. Yeah. Um, very keen to do this a couple of years ago. Um, took a while to get legs. You know, in TV world, TV shows work for, move very slowly. Yeah. Um, and it was just, yeah, um, Discovery took over Warner Brothers in terms of uh, production companies and they wanted something new and sort of homegrown in yeah. a bit of a different genre. And no one's really done a truck restoration show. Um, I used to be hooked on that fucking American one. Oh, the Trick My Truck? Check My Truck. That, oh. that, that was cool as hell. Yeah. Cool as hell. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, where you've got the American pickers and the porn stars yeah. and like all of that sort of style of reality that everyone loves. Yeah. So everyone loves the rags, the richer story. Um, and everyone loves a barn find in it and a cool bit of yeah. experience yeah. with it. And that's, the, this show, or the, you know, the, the new show is all about that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find a better response from this new show than the Mega Truckers? Or? Listen, both have been super popular. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, I haven't heard any negative feedback about the Aussie Truck Rehab. Yeah. Like, normally someone fucking whinges about me or has something to say, but it's it's, yeah. only, it's only been positive. I was fucking proud of you when I seen you come back up again. I know that. So it doesn't give a fuck about you. It's not back in spotlight. Do not send it. <laughs> Do not give a fuck. Here's the city, mate. My, my fucking phone number. I put my phone number on. I my, watched that today. I was looking on, on, my, on my advert. Yeah. He's what? not hard. That's what I'm looking at. You're not, you're not hard. That's fucking awesome, man. The gate's open here six days a week. Yeah. You know, and all these wankers that want to carry on that they've got to be for this or that. Yeah. They can, they can come and sit down here exactly where you're sitting. Yeah, yeah. And that's, um, that was awesome, man. I actually had a question here. How. Oh, you, you got some haters, obviously, and they got probably fucking no reason at all the hate except they watch a TV show. How far have your haters gone? Like, have you had threats? Have you had shit come at you? Like, um, you've been worried for your safety. Right? No. No? No. No, it was funny. Shane and I were just talking about the other day, a few years ago, we were coming back from Castellane Truck Show back in the HHA days, and there was this bloke in the road house there. And um, we sat in for breakfast, and I was in, in Red Dog, and I had Woodyard on the back, and Shane was, I think Shane was in the unit driving the truck, and was there, and it just said, hey, Tokyo, you mind around our own business, and Sprite walks in, and he goes, oh, fucking John Kelly, you're a fucking wanker. And I'm like, is that right, buddy? I said, happy fucking Monday to you too, buddy. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, you fucking big mouths and bad for the industry, and you this and that, and I'm And I'm like, I'm like, who the fuck are you? Hey, uh, yeah, and he's like carrying on like this, and he goes, well, I should fucking take you out and flog it out. And I said, I just got up, pushed the table, and said, right, let's go. Yeah. Let's go. Where, where do you want to do this? And then he, he fucking walked out, and I walked out with him, and I said, who's going first? And he's fucking put his gloves on, he got fucking rigorous gloves out and everything, I started laughing. Jesus Christ. He put his rigorous gloves on, and I said, who's going first? I said, I said me or you? And then um, he, he took a swim and completely fucking missed. And, and when he missed, I fucking just got in with one and that was it. That was it? Why not? That was it. That's it. End of story. Okay. And then I helped him up and said, you had enough? And he goes, oh, you know, I, 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 you know, you didn't, didn't really say much. And I said, mate, how about you just come in? I shout to breakfast and he shut the fuck up. Yeah. Fuck it, I listen Dickheads out there, eh? Yeah. I got, I got a little bit too. I got a bloody salted. I started working for a mate of mine. I was at ranch shop up in Airlie, and I, uh, my Sunday morning's bloke walked in. He came in cool as cool ass. I'm like, cool that. I spent my own seven dollars on the back of his head. It's fucking snapped. Yeah. It's fucking into me, and he's uh, did like props I give him. Yeah. Anyway, he's coming behind the counter, and like, cause I got, I got no peripheral vision, right? So yeah. like, I'm looking at that post over here, and I can't see you. I can't see my hand. Never yeah. see my hand. Right? Yeah. So I'm sitting on the computer. He's come around behind me. And I've got the other spike you got between your dockets. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's one of them there, I had a call to strill, just like that. Yeah. Well, he's come around and he's, I can't, I see, he's put his hand out to grab something, but fuck, he's got the spike. He's put me in a headlock, he's put it 
Did you try it? Really? Yeah, hell yeah, it's right before one. It was the most bizarre thing. It was having as much soap it was crazy. And then he's um, sort of roughly a bit, he slammed it down and he walked out. And uh, it was called the drill butt. Yeah. And um, so after that happened, like, he was a multi millionaire business owner in every bitch and very well known and had a big company there. So I went to court and it was just a joke. It's just it's got fucking, it got fucking, it got $700 fine in that commission. It was a joke. And uh, so I called him out. I called him out on general socials and talked about it. Yeah. And um, it fucking blew up and blew up. And this, they sh- just shut his business down for three days. I mean, they got the internet, bought it, phone calls, trends, and they just shut them down. Shut them down for three days. But then it fucking took a turn on me. Like I had his staff that turned on me. And I had all this hate at me then. Thinking, how the fuck does this prick come in and assault me? But on the other side. Yeah. And um, so I started avoiding Italy Beach. So I got out of there. And I've only sort of gone back last couple of months, and now I feel like I can walk around with my head out eye again. Yeah. But yeah, I'll out there for a bit, eh? But fuck, it was next level. Yeah. The world's a fucking hard place, and unfortunately, the world doesn't protect the right people. No. Nah. That was a joke, man. Fuck the way that fall went down was an absolute joke. You got one more for you, man. Um, oh, do you, have you, um, have you got a mentor? Like, who's he, your mentor? I've got some good mates that we sort of just. That I knock around with, that we spitball a lot of stuff, you know? Yep. Yep. Um, biggest, most expensive employee fuck up? Shane Cagle, rolling heavy six. Yeah? Yeah. With about a 6.8 with all generator on it. Oh, fuck. Oh, when do That's a pretty expensive fuck up. Yep. Oh, yeah. shit. But he got out of it. Without a scratch, and oh. the truck lived to another day, and the trailer lived to another day, and Generate. the generator is uh, probably still a monument just between August Eller and Mount Isley, I reckon. <laughs> uh, we, we, we think the jet fire truck, but she was. Uh, she was a generator. She was, <laughs> she was Australia's most expensive paperweight. Yeah. That's fucking spare parts, eh? Yeah. Um, what's your end goal, mate? What, what are you going to retire? You're going to do you know, this fucking drop dead? Mate, I've achieved more in my 43 years of living than I ever thought I would achieve. And if someone runs me over today, I think I've ever achieved for, yeah. for what I've done and how I've done it. So, yeah. uh, I live a very good life. Are you happy? Yeah. Yeah. Married again? No. No. No partner? Um, seeing someone, mate, yeah. Yeah, nice. But yeah, the last few years, it's um, the old Rex Hunt policy, mate. Guess I'm going to put it back. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, after you've been through, you know, as much as I've been through, a few shitty relationships, it's, uh, yeah. you know, I, I just bury myself in, in, in my work. Yeah. And, and my boys, you know, the best thing I've ever done is uh, went and bought a new wake boat about um, 18 months ago and yeah. got a place up in Somerset we go to all the time and, um, you know, me and the boys, that, that's our escape. Yeah, and you're taking the time to do that. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And We're that's, actually going there tomorrow. Oh, yeah? Yeah, Lake Wood. Yeah. It's a ripper spot. Yeah, I've never been there before. Yeah. Your godfather dropped me off, he's got a Lake Wood. Yeah, we go. Oh, yeah. 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 And a key nose. Yeah, it's good. Fucking take the day off and go up there. Mate, I wish I could. I'll now wake you. I wish I could. <laughs> blind, blind man burst on Kelly. 100%. Um, all right, that's it. Now, the last one's pretty fucking important. It's pretty heavy, this last question. Here we go. And you got to think about it. Hit me with a sample and check. Can I have a drop? Can you have a drop? Yeah. What do you want to drop? Up the trail. Yeah. Is there a long enough straight for a long way to drive on here? Or do we find something? What, at, at, on a scale of 1 to 10, how likely are you to crash? Zero. Okay. I just drove the road trailer from Burktown a few months ago. I'm, I'm only joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to chill? I'm from blind people, probably not, eh? Mate, thank you so much for giving me your time. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm glad I got to do this and get your story out there and voice. I've read a few articles. You've done a few articles and whatnot. Yeah. But I've got a lot of followers and I have truck problems. Yeah, in that industry, so they're all going to be fucking hanging up to listen to this. Well, thanks for taking the time to come out. Yeah, that awesome.